Hi guys, it's me, Professor D. Welcome back to my YouTube channel. On this video, I'm going to be doing another Kahoot and this is going to be covering physiological integrity. This is part two. If you haven't watched part one, that's okay. It really does not go in order, but make sure you watch uh, the entire series to get the most out of it. Now, as always, I'm gonna ask you to please support me and support this channel by liking this video. Give it that thumbs up. Um, press the red notification button so you'll be notified every single time a uh, new video is released. And please do not forget to subscribe to my channel if you haven't done so already. Something else to keep in mind. I'm now offering next generation NCLEX reviews and one-on-one -on -one tutoring or consultation sessions. So you can reserve your spot right now on my website, nexusnursinginstitute.com. Maybe you're still in school, but you're struggling. You have a test coming up and you have to do really, really well. Well, I have audio lessons also available on my website, nexusnursinginstitute.com. So be sure to check that out. And don't forget almost daily, you can find me covering a variety of nursing topics on my other social media platforms, such as TikTok, Instagram, and Facebook. Without any further ado, guys, let's get started. Physiological integrity, part two. What would you assess for in a patient suspected of having pernicious anemia? Would it be constipation, shortness of breath, dusky lips and gums, or smooth, sore, red tongue? Those of you who are on the live that was not able to join this Kahoot, you can still participate. Just go ahead and put your answer in the live. Okay, guys, the correct answer is smooth, sore, red tongue. In other words, what? red beefy tongue. Red beefy tongue, that is a classic symptom of pernicious anemia. Please keep in mind, with pernicious anemia, you have to have intrinsic factor. So the intrinsic factor, which is in the stomach, okay? That's what helps you absorb that vitamin B12. You need vitamin B12 to live or you will die. You will not live long. Vitamin B12 is, is um, essential to the CNS, okay? So, uh, uh, classic sign and symptom of pernicious anemia is the red beefy tongue, or as described here, smooth, sore, red tongue. You read the results for a sputum culture. The results indicated mycobacterium tuberculosis. What does this mean? Does it mean that the results are positive for active TB? Does it mean that the results indicate a less virulent strain of tuberculosis? Does it mean the results are inconclusive and a second uh, culture is required? Or does it mean that the results are unreliable unless the MANTU test was positive as well? Results are positive. The results are positive for active TB. And let me say this to you guys. As students, you tend to have a hard time when it comes to TB in your mind. For some reason, you want to think that a chest X-ray or a man two test slash PPD slash skin test, that's a def uh, definitive diagnostic test for tuberculosis. It absolutely is not, okay? The definitive, the definitive diagnosis, the test for diagnostic test for tuberculosis is a sputum culture where um, that culture grows and we actually see what's growing in the lungs and we see that it's the patient has TB. The MANTU test, also known as a PTPD test, also known as a skin test, that is a screening test. Even the chest x-ray is a screening test, right? But a definitive diagnostic test is going to be your sputum culture. A couple things you need to know. The sputum culture, you get that from the patient. You're going to take it early in the morning before the patient's had anything to eat. And what you're going to teach them is to cough up the sputum. We don't want them to spit because we don't want what's in their mouth. We want what's down there in the lungs. So we're gonna ask them to cough it up and not spit it up, okay? Select all that applies. Your patient asks you about her new diagnosis of Meniere's disease. What do you include in the teaching? Select all that applies. 
So are you going to include, let me move this. Are you going to include this disorder is caused by fluid in the middle ear? It's caused by an ear infection. It uh, causes ringing in the ears, vertigo, nausea, and vomiting. Cigarette smoking worsens the condition because of its vasoconstrictive effects. Salt and fluid retention can help by reducing the amount of fluid in the ear or antibiotics should clear the infection in 10 to 15 days. What teaching are you going to include in regards to Meniere's disease? All right, so let's talk about this. When it comes to Meniere's disease, what happens, guys, is the patient has fluid in the uh, middle ear. And why is this important to us? Well, what's the middle ear responsible for? Balance. So already, because of this, we know safety is going to be an issue with this patient. It also can cause ringing in the ears. It can cause the patient to have vertigo, um, nausea, maybe even vomiting. What you're going to teach the patient, again, look at this. Disorders caused by fluid in the middle ear. Yes, and remember the middle ear is important for balance. Ringing in the ears, vertigo, nausea, mare curve, true. Salt and fluid retention can help. That makes sense because remember, fluid follows salt. So if you decrease the salt, you're going to decrease the fluid, therefore decrease that fluid in the middle ear. And also, we're going to teach them to stay away from cigarette smoking. Cigarette smoking causes vasoconstriction and can make this even worse. Meniere's disease is not an infection of the ear, so the patient does not need um, antibiotics because the, the cause is not a bacterial infection. Your patient has acute pericarditis. What symptoms of cardiac tamponade would you be assessing for? And I spelled tamponade wrong, I'm sorry. But anyway, your patient's got pericarditis, you're looking for cardiac tamponade. What assessments are you gonna be looking for? Are you gonna be looking, uh, what symptoms are you gonna be looking for? Are you gonna be looking for out for a bradycardia, paradoxical pulse, flattened jugular veins, or bounding heart sounds? Which clinical manifestations are you going to be watching out for? Okay, guys, you're going to be watching out for paradoxical pulse. So let's talk about this. Your patient's got pericarditis. That's inflammation of, you know, that thin, um, that thin sac that surrounds the heart. Okay. That is like inflammation of that sac. That's the pericarditis. Now, when the patient has pericarditis, it can cause uh, cardiac tamponade, which is, um, What's the word I'm looking? A complication. Cardiac tamponade is a complication of pericarditis. And so what happens is um, that sac surrounding, the area surrounding the heart now becomes filled with fluid and blood and it compresses the heart. It applies pressure on the heart. So what are the signs and symptoms we may expect when it comes to cardiac tamponade? And the correct answer is paradoxical pulse. And that's when that patient takes a breath, we see the blood pressure drop. That's a problem. So you'd be watching out for that. Not bradycardia, because if anything, we'd see the heart rate increase because the heart's trying to compensate. Not flattened jugular veins. It's, if anything, we're going to see what? Distended jugular, vein, uh, jugular veins and not bounding heart sounds. If anything, they're going to be um, um, soft is not the word I'm, I'm looking for, but not bounding. Soft is what I'm going to say because I can't think of the word, but they're actually going to be soft heart sounds, not bounding. You're monitoring a newborn for increased intracranial pressure. Which assessment will you perform? Is it going to be a blood pressure looking for hypotension? INOs looking for dehydration? UA looking for infection? Or observing the anterior fontanelles looking for bulging? We're talking about increased intracranial pressure in a newborn. Which assessment are you going to do and why? Very good. Observe the anterior fontanelle for bulging. Why do you think it's bulging? Because of all that pressure. So that's what we're going to be looking for.
select all that applies. Which nursing interventions will you perform to protect the AV fistula of your patient that is on dialysis? Select all that applies. So here are your options. Palpate for thrills and auscultate for brewery every four hours. Palpate for brewery and auscultate for thrills every four hours. Check needle insertion site for bleeding. Check needle insertion site for infection. Give injections and take blood pressure readings in the affected arm. Place the patient's weight on the affected extremity. What precautions are you going to take for your patient that's on dialysis and they have an AV fistula? To Hanan, congratulations for passing your boards today. I'm so happy for you. Great job. By the way, guys, I'm offering Next Generation NCLEX reviews. You can book on my website, reserve your spot, nexusnursinginstitute.com. Great job. Okay, so let's talk about this. Yes, you're going to palpate for thrills and auscultate for brewery. You hear the brewery, but you feel the thrill. Yes, you're going to check the needle insertion site for bleeding. Let me tell you something. Whenever there is something invasive, you're always going to be worried about bleeding. Whenever there is something invasive, you're going to be concerned about infection. So you're going to check for bleeding. You're going to check for infection. These are all correct. Let's look at the wrong answers. Um, palpate for brewery, wrong. You listen for the brewery and you feel the thrill. Give injection sites and blood pressure on the affected arm. Absolutely not. That arm where that AV fistula is in place, no venipunctures, no blood pressures, nothing on that extremity. And you're never going to place weight on that affected extremity. You leave that extremity alone. Your patient with glomerulonephritis is going into acute kidney failure. You assess for which complication of a kid acute kidney failure? Would it be bradycardia, hypertension, decreased urine output, or decreased central venous pressure? Wait a minute. This is not a select all that applies. Choose one. Okay, guys, the correct answer, and nine of you guys chose decrease your output. I want you to think about the pathology of what's happening here. It's hypertension. So your patient who has glomerulonephritis, right, what's affected here? The glomerulus. Remember the glomerulus, that's what causes filtering. It filters out the toxins from the blood to make the urine. So patients got glomerulonephritis. They're going to, into acute kidney failure where the kidney's not going to be working. Remember, the kidney is responsible for what? Excretion of waste. So instead of getting rid of the waste through the urine, the patient's holding on to all that waste right? So they're holding on to all that fluid. All that fluid is pushing against the vascular space, causing what? Hypertension. You're not going to see bradycardia. If anything, you're going to see the heart rate go up because the heart's trying to compensate for all of that fluid that it needs to push out. You're not going to see decreased cardiac output because the patient's holding on to a whole lot more fluid. If anything, it would be increased and you're not going to see decreased central venous pressure. They've got all this fluid they're holding on to. You may see the opposite increase. So what you're going to be concerned most is going to be hypertension. That patient is holding on to all their sodium. All those electrolytes are supposed to be gone in the fluid and they're holding on to all their fluid. That's going to increase the patient's blood pressure. What would be your priority consideration in caring for a patient that's in Buck's traction after a hip fracture? Is it going to be lack of diversional activity due to bed rest? Difficulty performing ADLs because of the need for traction? Lack of mobility as a result of the traction device? Or decreased social interactions because of physical restraints? What do you guys say? Okay, 
Lack of mobility. Let's talk about this. Whenever you're asked about what's the priority, you always got to say to yourself, what's going to harm my patient the most? That's our priority, right? So we got a patient who's in Bugs Traction. By the way, you need to know that Bugs Traction is a type of skin traction. It's non-invasive. It's short term. It keeps the bone aligned and keeps the muscles from uh, spazzing out until the patient gets surgery. Great. So your patient is in Bugs Traction. What's going to be our concern? When it comes to lack of diversion activity, difficulty performing ADL, decreased social interactions, they do not take precedence over lack of mobility. Why are we so concerned about lack of mobility? Patients not moving much, blood isn't circulating much. Blood isn't circulating much, guess what blood likes to do? It likes to start to clot. Now we're worrying about patients getting blood clots. God forbid that clot moves, travels to the lungs, patient gets a pulmonary embolism. They're already at risk for blood clots and a PE just by the fact that they got a broken hip. Now they're not moving. So that is a huge concern. That's number one. Number two, what is another big concern when our patient's not moving? Infection. Patient can mess around and get pneumonia or other types of infections. So that is a very big problem, lack of mobility. That's going to be our uh, priority when you're looking at these choices. That takes priority. Select all that applies. Your new admission has a diagnosis of hypothyroidism. Which clinical manifestation would you expect to see in the patient with hypothyroidism? Select all that applies. Here are your choices. Weight loss, weight gain, hypotension, hypertension, cold intolerance, heat intolerance. What would you expect to see in your patient with hypothyroidism? What's the game code? The game code is 4655321. 4655321. Those of you watching on YouTube, I also have TikTok going live. So I'm kind of going back and forth between you two. All right. So your patient has high po thyroidism, which is high po function of the thyroid gland. What's the thyroid gland responsible for? Metabolism. So when the thyroid function is decreased, metabolism is decreased. Patients burning less calories. We expect to see, um, oop. I am so sorry. Why do I have weight loss for hypothyroidism? That is a lie and hypotension. And <gasps> I'm so sorry. I put a, chart, a check mark next to the wrong ones. You guys were right. All of these go with hypothyroidism. When the patient had, I got to think about this. I'm confused. Hold on. Patient has hypothyroidism. Thyroid function is low. They're not burning calories. So they're going to gain weight. They're not losing weight. They're gaining weight. So you 17 that chose weight gain, you are absolutely right. I chose the wrong answer. They're going to be gaining weight because they're not burning calories. Hypothyroidism, is the blood pressure going to be um, up or it's going to be down? Now, the patient who has hypothyroidism, we're going to see um, uh, weight gain, but the blood pressure is going to be low. Cold intolerance, they're going to have cold intolerance. Because remember, uh, the thyroid function is not working properly. They're not burning calories. We see a decrease in function. So they're going to have cold intolerance. Let's talk about, about, let's talk about the opposite. Let's talk about the patient who has um, hyperthyroidism. They're burning lots of calories, right? Their metabolism's increased. They're going, they're going, they're going, they're going, they're going. They're all over the place. Guess what? They're going to always be hot because they're going, going, going. So that patient's going to have heat intolerance. That person's the one who's going to be losing weight, right? They're the ones who's going to, um, everything is up with them. They're the ones who's going to have high blood pressure because everything's going, 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 going. When you think of hypothyroidism, this is a perfect example. You remember Eeyore from, um, I'm about to show my age. What was that cartoon uh, with the bear? Guys, what's the cartoon with the bear? The yellow bear with Eeyore. 
your was Winnie the Pooh. Thank you. Okay, guys, you remember Winnie the Pooh? And then there was a donkey. His name was Eeyore. And he was always like this. He was always sad and depressed. That's hypothyroidism. Your thinking is down. Cognition is down. The patient with hypothyroidism, it takes a minute before they can form their thoughts. So when you ask them a question, you got to give them time to think because their cognition has slowed down. Heart rate has slowed down. Blood pressure has slowed down, right? Everything is slow. And they're even losing, uh, they're even gaining weight because they're not burning calories. They're not moving. Everything has slowed down. They have cold intolerance because everything has slowed down. Where you have the opposite, the patient with hyperthyroidism, I want you to think of them like the patient that has bipolar, but they're in the manic phase. So they're going, they're going, they're going, they're all over the place. Their mind is going a, a million miles an hour. They're talking, talking, talking. So the person with hyperthyroidism, you're going to put them in the room by themselves because if you put somebody in their room, they're going to talk that person to death, right? They have heat intolerance because they're going, 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 going. They're going to be hot all the time. The heart rate's going to be up. The blood pressure is going to be up. That type of person, you got to give them lots of food. You got to give them foods high in calories. Why? Because they're burning so many calories. You're going to give them foods high in carbs because they're burning so much of um their calories. So that is your difference between your hyper and your hypothyroidism. I'm so sorry. I really messed up on the screen. I don't know what I was thinking on the screen. Please forgive me, but I hope my explanation made sense to you. Oh, one more thing I want to tell you before I move off of the screen. When it comes to hyper and hypothyroidism, because you will get a test question on this and you got to make sure you understand this. Your thyroid. So, um, your T3 and T4 is going to match what's going on with the patient. And your TSH is going to be the opposite. So I'm going to give you an example. If your patient has hyperthyroidism, so thyroid function is up, guess what's also going to be up? Your T3 and T4. Those are your thyroid hormones, right? Guess what's going to go the opposite way? Guess what's going to be down? your thyroid stimulating hormone. And it makes sense. I want you to think about this. Just follow me. If the thyroid function is up, your T3 and T4 is up. Do you need any more T3 and T4? No. So therefore your TSH, the thyroid stimulating hormone, what actually makes you more of the, makes you make more of the T3 and T4, it makes sense that it's going to be down. And opposite way, if thyroid function is down, you have hypothyroidism. Thyroid function is down. T3 and T4 is down. Guess what? You need more T3 and T4. So you expect the TSH to go the opposite way. You expect to see an increase in thyroid stimulating hormone because your body needs more of the T3 and T4. So the T3 and T4 is always going to match what the thyroid gland is doing. And the TSH is always going to go the opposite way. Make sure you guys know that. You're assessing for cardiogenic shock in your patient that recently had a myocardial infarction. What signs and symptoms are you going to be looking for? Is it going to be oligurin bradycardia, peripheral edema and descended jugular veins, pale appearance and hepatic engorgement, tachycardia, confusion, and hypotension, dry skin and paleness, or Professor D, I have no clue. I give up at this point. What do you guys say? Okay. You're going to see tachycardia, confusion, and hypotension. So your patient just had a heart attack. They had a myocardial infarction. Now we're concerned about cardiogenic shock. And in cardiogenic shock, there is not enough blood and fluid for your heart to pump out to perfuse important organs such as your brain and your spleen and your liver and everything else. So what do you see? Tachycardia. Why? Again, your heart is trying to compensate. Whenever there's a condition that there's decreased perfusion, there's decreased blood flow, patients bleeding out, whatever's causing that decreased perfusion, right? Your heart, your body's going to try to compensate. So we're going to see the heart rate go up because the heart's trying to pump out fluid that it doesn't have, but it's still going to try. So you're going to see tachycardia. Why do you see confusion? Remember, oxygen 
is being carried in hemoglobin that is being carried in the red blood cells that is part of what the blood if the patient has cardiogenic shock they don't have enough blood to go out to the organs including what the brain what is the first sign and symptom in the patient that's not having enough oxygenation to the brain decrease um cognition you start to see confusion irritability agitation, those, those changing, um, co uh, cognition or behavior, right? That's why you see the confusion. And of course, hypotension, because there's not enough oxygenated blood. So guess what? There's not enough fluid pushing against the vessel. The blood pressure's down. Tachycardia, confusion, hypotension. Those are classic symptoms of cardiogenic shock. You gave your patient eight units of humulin regular insulin subcutaneously at 7.30 in the morning. When should you be most alert for symptoms of hypoglycemia? Is it going to be 9.30 to 11.30 a.m., 11.30, 1.30 p.m., 1.30, 3.30 p.m., or 3.30 to 5.30 p.m.? What do you guys think? My username on uh, Kahoot is Nexus Nursing. Very good. 9.30 to 11.30. Why? When did we give this insulin? At 7.30. And we expect that peak time to be around when? Around two hours. So two hours later, around your 9.30 to 11.30. Let me tell you guys something. When you get a test question about giving insulin, you're administering insulin, right? When you're asked about when you should expect to feed your patient, what they're really asking you is for the onset of that particular insulin. So when you're going to feed your patient, that is the onset. If you're asked about when you're going to reassess your patient or when are you going to be concerned, what they're really asking you about is the peak time of that insulin. If they ask you when you plan to give the next dosage of insulin, what they're really asking you is the duration time of that particular insulin. So just keep that in mind so you don't get confused when you get these types of questions. Last question, select all that applies. Which finding would you expect to see in your patient with Addison's disease? Select all that applies. Here's your choices. Peripheral edema, excessive facial hair, hypoglycemia, hypertension, Signs of dehydration, or at this point, Professor D, I failed. I don't know this stuff. What do you guys say? You guys are quiet on the live. Are you thinking this is select all that applies? More than one answer choice. I really hope they don't get rid of TikTok. I have a lot of fun with you guys up here. Okay, let's talk about this. So the correct answer is what we expect to see in the patient with Addison's disease, where you need to add salt, add sex, add sugar, right? In Addison's disease, you need to add salt. Why? Because the mineral uh, cortical steroids are low. What is the mineral cortical steroid? Sodium. They have low sodium. Sodium is supposed to be 135 to 145, but their sodium's low. Guess what? When sodium's low, guess what else is going to be low? Fluids, because sodium follows fluids. So if sodium's low, fluids low, this patient uh, is going to exhibit signs and symptoms of dehydration. Boom, right here signs of dehydration. Remember in Addison's disease, you have to add salt, sex, and sugar. So we talked about the salt. Let's talk about the sex and the sugar. Something else we see in Addison's dis disease, what's down is the sex hormones, the androgens, right? So um, what those secondary sex characteristics. So we're not going to see an increase in facial hair. If anything, we see a decrease in facial hair. So that's why we didn't choose facial hair. And in Addison's disease, we need to add sugar, 
What do I mean when I say sugar? Your glucocorticosteroids, right? Because patient's going to be at risk for hyper hypo, excuse me, glycemia. Glucose is supposed to be 7110. If the patient has Addison's disease, we have to add sugar because they don't have enough of it. So that's why the two answers are hypoglycemia and signs of dehydration. And again, we see signs of dehydration because of the decreased sodium. Look at the wrong answer choices. Peripheral edema. We see that in the opposite. We see that in Cushing's. Excessive hair. We see that in the opposite. We see that in Cushing's. Hypertension, we see that in the opposite. We see that in Cushing's. So in Cushing's, I want you to think about that patient having too much salt, sex, and sugar. And in Addison's, they don't have enough salt, sex, and sugar. And guys, that is it for this Kahoot. You guys did a great job. Let's see how you did. Okay, guys, thank you so much for watching this video. Please let me know what you thought about this video in the comment section. Don't forget to like this video, subscribe to the channel if you haven't done so already, and press that red notification button so you'll be notified every single time a new video is released. If you have graduated, you're studying for your boards, you need that extra push. Be sure to reserve your spot for my next generation NCLEX review that I give. You can reserve your spot right now on my website, nexusnursinginstitute.com. Or maybe you need a one-on-one -on -one tutoring session. You need a consultation. Again, you can reserve your spot on my website, nexusnursinginstitute.com. Guys, thank you so much for watching. You guys will catch me on the next video.